Lupin is the first culprit uh, on the program today. The stock surged more than 60% in 2024 so far. We are now joined by Mr. Ramesh Swaminathan, ED and Global CFO at Lupin, uh, to uh, talk about business and some of the developments. Uh, Mr. Swaminathan, good morning. Uh, first of all, apologies. Sorry to have kept you waiting uh, with markets, but they are. So, uh, you know, uh, so let's start talking about the latest, right, which is the MyBetric generic. Uh, now, we understand that the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, the judgment has gone against generic companies like uh, Lupin and Zydus. Could you tell us what is the status of the litigation? Are you still selling this uh, drug right, uh, right now in the U.S. as we speak? Uh, and uh, w what is your expectation about how much you will make uh, from this in F525 and F526? Firstly, let me begin by thanking you for having us on. Um, regarding uh, Mira Begron, the first thing that I would like to state is that it's actually sub, uh, sub jury, so I wouldn't like to delve on it for too long. But I would say that we are indeed selling this drug, and we are pretty confident about our case. Um, and from that perspective, um, you know, we continue to to sell it. Hmm. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, but uh, this is so this is still in the courts right now. So I, I understand you don't want to go too much into detail. Uh, but the Court of Appeals decision went against generics, right? So will you have to stop selling it at some point or uh, just... It to... didn't go against the generics and it only it got referred back to the same bench, uh, so for the same trial courts. So it is not, uh, I wouldn't say it is actually against generics at all. Okay. Uh, just one last, I won't uh, press you beyond that. Estimates are than F525, you'll make between 120 and $180 million. Uh, is, that, uh, is that on track? Or are those wildly off those estimates? It'd be an unfair question to ask because essentially we never de, uh, you know, uh, delve into um, product-wise details. Suffice to say that we are doing pretty well in the product also. Okay. Uh, morning, sir. If you could just give us a status on another drug. I think the kidney drug, Jainar Q generic. Sorry if I'm getting the pronunciation wrong because we understand the innovator of the drug Otsuka has filed an appeal against a verdict that would have otherwise favored companies like Lupin. So what's the status here? Is Lupin going to launch the drug as you had planned in 2025? Or is there going to be a delay? Or would you look at an at-risk launch? Just speaking about Tolvaptin, um, the fact of the matter is you've actually you know, won that case and we are pretty confident about actually launching it. It is a pretty large drug. Um, uh, it's a REMS product and from that perspective, I would expect it to be limited, comp you know, it would continue for some time from our perspective. Um, and uh, very, very um, a beat about that particular product next year, for the next year. So when are you launching it, sir? It'll be possibly in April uh, 20, uh, 25, 26, 25, next year. And will this be an at-risk launch? No, Teluapton isn't an at-risk launch. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Swaminathan, hi, sir. Morning. Uh, now, a slightly broader question. Um, how you're seeing the U.S. business overall sort of uh, move along and some of your, of course, marquee names like Albuterol, uh, Spiriva, Generic, etc. So uh, what is the prognosis going forward? And I just want to understand whether politics at all impacts business in any way when it comes to your U.S. operations. And, you know, does it really matter to you uh, who comes to power? And also tell us because we, I mean, it's a little difficult to track all the manual details. For instance, our previous guest was just highlighting that in general, one camp is looking at a, you know, a big hike in corporate taxes, while Mr. Trump obviously wants them lower. But on the, the healthcare side, in terms of policies, could there be any significant impact on generic company operations like yourselves? Too many questions in the same breath. Uh, let me take the first part of the question uh, regarding how well we are doing. We continue to uh, see um, pretty good buoyancy on the top line in America. So the recent launches, you know, which includes, of course, our respiratory uh, portfolio, you now Albutrol and then Spiriva have continued to do pretty well. We've also bought into a few brands out there, Zopinex, Brovana. They also continue to do pretty well. Um, in a general sense, uh, you know, we've also been launching a host of other products, OSD and the like. You know, so if you look at, for example, we had Darnavi last year. Uh, this year we had, uh, you know, uh, 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 we had quite a few other products. In, in this year, for example, we are looking at, uh, you know, some ophthalmic products as well. Uh, next year, we're looking at uh, Waptin. And of course, when you speak about, in fact, the entire respiratory portfolio, um, and we are actually working on the entire range of products in that portfolio. And um, over the next five years, we'll be launching a number of products. 
Apart from that, uh, we also have a number of products on the injectables front also. Uh, so from our perspective, you know, the, we're still pretty bullish about the overall prospects for America. And uh, that would be true with, in fact, the other markets as well. Uh, but having reverting back to your question about uh, the political situation out there, uh, we believe that uh, affordable medicine is certainly going to be, you know, um, you know, the case, irrespective of whichever party is in is in power, so be it the Republicans or is it going to be Democrats, I don't think we're going to be impacted at all. Um, you know, there's, of course, the IRA and, and other thing, other acts, uh, regulations, which uh, might actually impact the the uh, the, the, uh, farms, the uh, ethical companies, not so much the, uh, you know, the generic companies, because we are all about uh, affordable medicine, and that would not uh, impact us so much. So, sir, the estimates on the street right now, uh, uh, the analysts are working with estimates of, say, 220 to $230 billion of a quarterly run rate for your U.S. business. Are they, are they fair estimates or are they conservative? Can you actually you know, do better than that? I'm not asking for this quarter, but generally, that's the assumption uh, for the next couple of quarters. I would say that given the pipeline that we have um, and um, given the fact that the respiratory products will continue because um, they're a lot more sticky, I would say uh, the run rate that we that we saw last quarter would certainly continue in the future as well. So 200, 220, 225 would certainly be the, the range for the next few quarters. And uh, around 21% in margins for, uh, for 25 overall? Uh, last year, um, yeah, last quarter, for example, we did 23, but that is, we also kind of guided that it could perhaps uh, turn out to be a little lower in the quarters to come because the fact that last quarter, um, the overall R&D spends were a tad lower than normal. Um, so given that, we were guided for you know, about 20 and a half percentage points. Um, very confident that we would actually be um, you know, on track to achieve uh, more than that. Okay. Uh, you, you know, you also uh, indicated that you could look to spin off some adjacencies like OTC, diagnostics, digital, etc., and get in outside investors. Any movement on that? Um, so let me put it this way. You know, um, a capital allocation policy has been actually been you know, predicated on what the board really wants. And uh, when I speak about, in fact, the, the adjacencies, diagnostics, digital, all of this are very important to us. But having said that, these are not going to be the dominant themes. Uh, from that perspective, there is actually uh, a poll, you know, the upper threshold in terms of um, investments that have been kind of prescribed by the board also. We will not be exceeding that. So we already spun it off into uh, into subsidiary companies and uh, potentially be looking at uh, involving, you know, private equity houses or other passive partners to partner in the journey. Uh, so they kind of spin on their own access. So the idea is, of course, to benefit from these businesses without actually losing sight of the fact that our capital allocation policies should not be kind of uh, dislodged. So um, it's it's basically uh, it's basically that. So we are confident that um, you know uh, when they uh, you know reach critical mass from our overall size perspective, we should be in a position to kind of place it with uh, with outsiders. Okay, just a quick word. Uh, I think the USFD inspected and issued three um, observations for your Pithampur Unit One. What's the nature of the observations, uh, and what's the status of the facility now? Uh, we are, you know, we are, as I said, you know, so in so far as this facility is concerned, of course, it did go through a recent, uh, um, uh, you know, the observations are, uh, from our perspective, uh, uh, you know, quite um, manageable, and um, we look forward to getting, um, you know, this sorted out, uh, you know, and and with our responses in the in the in the immediate future. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll leave it on that note. Good uh, having you on the show today. Thank you very much for uh, all the perspective and um, some sense on how the U.S. business is shaping up. Thanks for joining in. Let's quickly move on. And now